In this video, we're going to look at functions of a complex variable. So here's the setup. Let g be some subset of the complex numbers, and let's let f be a function from g to c. And just to remind you about this notation, what we're saying here is that you input a complex number that comes from g, and that should output a complex number. So let me also give you a way to think about the schematic of how a function works. So I start off with a copy of the complex plane, and I care about the set g. What I'm going to do is I'm going to consider g again as sort of the set of all possible inputs, and I'm going to input them into some function. And then the set of all possible outputs is just some other set in the complex plane over here. And so that blue set gets a name also. We'll refer to that as the image of g, or the image of g under f. It gets its own notation. We usually refer to it as f of g, so like f of a set. And uh, just what is that defined to be, if you let me zoom in, that should be the set of all complex numbers w, such that w equals f of z for some z and g. In other words, it's all complex numbers that are outputs of f, is how I want you to think about that. So that is what the image of g will be. And so note that we can typically visualize the domain of the function f and the image of f. And while I'm here, let me also say, I use this word domain, and it has a special topological meaning sometimes, um, where domain, if you watch the video about basic topology of the complex plane, a domain referred to a connected open set in the complex plane. Um, for right now though, G is just any subset, and so I just mean it kind of in the college algebra sense, it's just the domain of the function, the set of all inputs. It doesn't have any uh, prescribed topological properties right now. And so, good, I just wrote that down. So not necessarily the topological definition of domain, just set of all inputs, like you're used to from, again, like college algebra or calculus. And so we can, so we can typically visualize the domain and the image of a complex function, because they're two-dimensional, just like I've drawn, just two two-dimensional blobs. And so f is just something that transform one blob maybe into another blob, is how I want you to think about that. But that's different than a graph. And so we cannot visualize the graph of the function f, because if you think about it, the graph would have to live in four-dimensional space. And so since the domain and the codomain are both two-dimensional, the, the graph would live in four-dimensional space. So not easy to visualize. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about trying to visualize the graph of a complex function. And for the rest of this video, even, we're not going to worry too much about um, you know, what is this domain, what, is its, uh, what does its image look like under this particular function. So for the rest of this video, we want to get used to function notation because it can be a little bit tricky sometimes. And the trickiness comes down to the fact that there are multiple ways to represent a complex number, like we've talked about in previous videos. So let's look at a concrete example. Let's take the complex value function, so from c to c, of f of z equals z squared. So I just square the input, so I want you to think of this function f. Now, if z has real part x and imaginary part y, in other words, you can write it as x plus i, y, then we might rewrite this function as, well, x plus i, y all squared. And remember to do your algebra, you have to FOIL that, right? And so if you FOIL it, do x plus i, y times x plus i, y, you should come out with x squared minus y squared is the real part, plus i times 2xy. So 2xy would be the imaginary part. And so, just to recap here, the real part of z squared should be x squared minus y squared, and the imaginary part of z squared should be 2xy. Now, if you notice, those are each functions that depend on x and y. And so, we could label them with function notation as well. Let's think of x squared minus y squared, let's just call that u of xy, and let's call 2xy v of xy. And so what I'm getting at here is that uh, I've got a real part of this function, u, and an imaginary part of this function, v, where u and v are just real value functions of two real variables. And so here's the recap. To put it all together, to try to say it a little bit more clearly, complex functions have real and imaginary parts too, just like complex numbers do. So it's very common to just generically write, if you've got a complex function, People t sometimes just write it as f of z equals u of xy plus i v of xy. So like in my example up there, instead of z squared, somebody might write it as x squared minus y squared plus i 2xy, where you're really emphasizing what the real and the imaginary parts are. And sometimes we use even less notation because, you know, we like to drop symbols when we can. 
introduce a little brevity into the notation. So when it's understood that u and v are functions of x and y, then some authors or textbooks might just have f equals u plus iv. Where again, it's understood that these are that f is a function of a complex variable z that has real and imaginary part x and y. Therefore, u and v are functions of those x and y's. So again, we want to be comfortable with all the different ways to write this notation down. So let's look at some fun facts about z, f of z equals z squared, just that particular one I wrote down. So just for this guy, because he looks familiar, like, oh, I'm thinking college algebra, it's a parabola, right? But if you remember what we said above, it's not going to be a parabola because it's not really easy to visualize what its graph is. It doesn't really make sense to call this four-dimensional graph a parabola. Who the heck knows what it looks like in four dimensions? So it's a little bit different than, uh, than what I would like to... Um, try to relate it to something that I know. I can't necessarily just relate it to y equals x squared. It's a little bit different. Here's another really wild thing about it. So I know that my, my parabola from r to r, thinking of that as the parabola now, you know, in the plane, f of x equals x squared, where x is real, I know that that is not onto. It's not surjective. And if you think about a graph of y equals x squared, you don't get any graph below the x-axis, so it's not surjective. But when I think about this complex value function or this function of a complex variable, f of z equals z squared, it is surjective, it is onto. And this is pretty cool. And let's talk about why. We can actually prove it, it's not too hard. So let's let w be a complex number. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite w in polar coordinates. So w should be written as r times e to the i theta, where r is some positive real number and theta is some real number. I think if you watch my video on polar coordinates for complex numbers, I used phi instead of theta. And I just got done teaching a calculus class this semester, so we use theta a little bit more often, so it's on the brain. All right, so I've got my complex I'm sorry, my polar coordinate representation of this complex number w. And then, if you watched another video of mine about the extension of Dumois' theorem, which told me how to take powers and uh, rational powers of complex numbers, I know how to take square roots. So let's think about what would be the square roots of w. Well, z1 would be just r to the 1 half e to the i theta divided by 2. And remember, up there in the exponent, there's some plus 2k pi over 2. In this case, k is 0. You can go watch that video if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And I have another root, z2, which is r to the 1 half, e to the i, theta over 2, plus pi. That pi there is 2k pi over 2, where k equals 1, so the 2's canceled. And again, if you didn't track through that all the way, maybe rewind it. Make sure you watch that uh, video about the extension of the Moff's theorem first. And maybe come back to this if it didn't click. So what's the point? I have these two complex numbers, z1 and z2, such that when you plug z1 into f, f squares it, but when I square it, I just get e r e to the i theta, which of course is w. And really, I could stop there to conclude it's on to. But just for fun, I've got z2 also. And when I square z2, remember that's what f does, when I square z2, I get r e to the i theta plus 2 pi i. So just be careful. You know, you multiply that 2 through the exponent, but then you also have to uh, distribute the i through. Some silly algebra mistakes can happen in a complex class. Sometimes the complex analysis part, the theory and stuff, can be easy. It's keeping track of all the college algebra we forgot that's hard. Anyway, now you can use your exponent rules, and you could write that as r times e to the i theta times e to the 2 pi i. We can split that up. And I know that e to the 2 pi i is just a funny way to write the complex number 1. So that's the same thing as 1. So my point is, you're just left with r e, r e to the i theta, which of course is w. And uh, just to recap, what did we do? We've shown that for any complex number w, there exists a complex number z. In fact, we found two of them. We found z1 and z2 above, such that f of z equals w. And that's the definition of surjective.